Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed breakfast. And some of you might have looked up the title of my talk, Maximum Consumption, which is that old King song. And if you have, you would have noticed it's all about food. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Or in other terms, why should you think about food when you start your next project? You're probably familiar with this figure, or you've heard it before. 9.5 billion people is one of the predictions that we will be in the year 2050. So in my view, that's a lot of mouth to feed. Or as some clever people from the World Economics Forum have worked out, we will have to produce as much food in the next 50 years as we've done in the last 10,000 years combined. Now here's another interesting thing. Of those 9.5 billion people, 75% will be living in cities. If you calculate that through, that is the global population of 2004, which will be living in cities. Now, to get there, we will have to build an awful lot of cities and densify existing ones. And when we plan those cities, we determine things like you know, land uses, open space, buildings, the massing, we work infrastructure. We add up usually gross floor area, and then we work out demands and needs for things like water, energy, transport, and waste. But I would argue, you can build a city, and it doesn't need anything. You can build a lot of buildings, even whole cities really, lock them up, leave them empty, and they don't need nothing. It's only once you add the magic ingredient, and that is you, people in the buildings, and people who live and work in cities, that you start having all those demands for transport, energy, water, waste, and so on. But I think there's one thing we also really need, and that isn't really considered when we do buildings or cities, usually. And that is food. We just expect it to magically turn up, to be in the shops there for us whenever we need it. <coughs> so let's take a look at where our food actually comes from. This is a map of the world's arable land. And it shows some of the best places where our food can be grown. Now, this is another map. It's a night shot of the Earth, and it shows where the cities are. Basically, where the lights are, you can see are most of the cities. I don't know if any one of you noticed in the transition that the cities are pretty much in the same places as where the arable land is. So therefore, cities and where we grow food are competing directly, not only for the land, but also for resources. To make up for this, we have started importing food from further and further afield, which means that some of our food is actually better traveled than the people who eat it. So it's perhaps no surprise when I came across this really astonishing figure. According to the Australian Conservation Foundation, food makes up 28% of our carbon emissions. Just by comparison, 12% is the carbon emissions the construction industry makes up. So it's 2.3 times as much is in the food than it is in building buildings. And if you look at our eco-footprint, and eco-footprint doesn't look only at carbon, it looks at land take, it looks at water, the whole picture, <coughs> it's even worse. The eco-footprint of the Londoners was calculated in the year 2000, and 41% of the eco-footprint of Londoners was related to food. So if you want to start somewhere, this might be really a good space. <coughs> so given this context and given the challenges, I think we really need to rethink the relationship between food and the built environment. We really need to think about how cities and buildings can relate to food. We need to think about where we grow our food perhaps in the city or at least nearby, given that the two directly compete for resources and space, it will require new ideas. We also might want to think about what we eat, perhaps less meat, perhaps more of the sprouting stuff, or even insects, as the BBC's Tomorrow's Food program was recently suggesting. Well, the point about those two really is that they grow really quick they need a lot less resource, and you could grow them in cities easily. But I think also we need to think about how we can make food part of the urban infrastructure. So it's not an afterthought, not something that magically arrives, but that it kind of is part of the resource loops. So instead of simply a waste to energy loop, which I'm sure most of you are familiar, where you compost some food into a digester, create biogas, and then create energy, you may just find, if you add food production 
and the whole system, you get a whole new complexity to the system. So you not only create biogas for energy, but you create fertilizer for farming. And you can use the waste heat and carbon from the energy production, from the electricity production, to feed the farming as well. So it allows you to close several loops and it becomes a whole new, more integrated, complex system. And perhaps there are plenty of resources in cities anyway, like the stuff you flush down on the toilet. I know you had breakfast, but yes, this is urine. <laughs> and it is very rich in phosphate. And phosphate is an essential ingredient in plant growth. It's in all fertilizers, and at the moment, it is fully mined. Now, if you think about things being mined, you will realize quickly that it's not a sustainable process because we, once we mined it all, it's gone. So it's really something we need to start thinking about early, that we don't hit problems. So I think if we can start thinking food as an integral part of cities and of our urban infrastructure, we just might end up producing more local food, which is fresher and therefore more nutritious because it doesn't have to travel so far. It might have a lower <laughs> eco-footprint and it might help us close several loops. Does this sound too good to be true? Well, let's do some time travel together and take a short trip to the past, to Paris in the year 1878. This is where they built the world's first sewage farm. Sewage wastewater was used to irrigate the farms on this land. And it was extremely fertile. You had 40 farmers that were producing six times the market value of fruit and vegetables than what was grown on the same land before. So it was really a good example of how that could work. Well, even if you come somewhat closer to home, during the Second World War, yes, I'm German, but I mentioned the war, <laughs> the UK was, as it is today, highly dependent on food imports. And when we Germans made a blockade, it resulted in food shortages. So becoming self-sufficient was a very important point for the British in order to win that war. Thankfully, they did. And in order to do that, every bit of land in cities was turned over to food production, including places like Hyde Park. But also bomb craters were used for growing food. And of course, lovely rooftops were converted for food growing. So by the end of the war, about 1.4 million plots were contributing some estimated 1.3 million tons of food to the UK. But let's fast forward to the 21st century and go to Brooklyn in New York. This is Brooklyn Grange, and they run a lovely rooftop farm on top of a building. It's the largest soil-based rooftop farm. There are about 500 tons of soil on this roof, and they manage about 3.8 million gallons of rainwater. The farm helps to reduce the heat island effect in the area, and it also helps to clean the air. But as well, it helps reducing the heating, cooling, and ventilation requirements for the floors directly below. And yet, at the same time, it provides very fresh and nutritious food for the local community. And it helps, of course, reducing the food miles. Now, of course, not every roof can take 500 tons of soil. I accept that. But in Montreal, another example, they have put a greenhouse on the roof, and the plants grow in a water-based solution, which has the nutrition in it. It's also operated by a commercial enterprise called Lufa Farms, and it's a growing business. They started with one farm in 2011, they currently have two, and they're about to open their third farm. But farming can also be part of the temporal land use strategy, and I think it really has a place there. This is a farm on a prime piece development in Amsterdam's business district, Zaudas. After the financial crisis of 2008, construction came to a halt in Amsterdam in this part, and they had to rethink how they were going to do and develop this area. So we worked with the local authorities and the development agencies and proposed to create a temple farm there. And instead of having an empty fenced of building site, this cornfield and a pig farm sprung up. It became a real destination and focus for the local community and it created a sense of identity and place. It was so successful, it was actually sponsored by Accenture, and in the following years, on the same land, there were running allotments growing there. 
And guess what? Interestingly, not far from that farm, the conference center Rye has recently opened a building which has an integrated vertical farm. They grow tomatoes and cucumbers which are served in the meals in the restaurant in the conference center. And the staircase come farm is an integral part of the building's ventilation and uh, climate control concept. The plants provide shading for the officers, they help to cool the air with their vapor, and they help to humidify it in winter. So it's a really integrated part of the whole system. It's not just an add-on or a bolt-on. And the Japanese recruitment company, Persona, has taken this even one step further. They started with a kind of showcase rice farm in the basement to attract new talent. But they have gone on to convert their entire building into an urban farm. So now, instead of a 1960s office block, you really have food growing everywhere, between and in meeting rooms, around the staircases. All food is harvested. It's prepared and served on site in the canteen. They also encourage their staff to look after the plants. They have permanent farmers, but they also encourage their staff. And they found that the interaction with the plants provided improvement in mental health, in productivity, and created relaxation in the workplace. And in 2014, of all companies, Jones Lang LaSalle launched a rooftop farm on top of the Bank of America building in Hong Kong. Isn't it really interesting that out of all sectors, the property industry is at the leading edge of this? So I think what I've shown so far is that there is pragmatic reasons to look for food production closer to the city. There's a growing number of people who are doing it, it can be economically viable, and it also can be a key differentiator for the building or the development. It can really create and add value. But let's go one step further and think about what it could be if you don't retrofit, but if you start considering it from the outset. <coughs> At a conceptual level, there could be a complete symbiosis between development and food production. Like in this project in the Netherlands, it's called Zonneturp. It's linking 100 new homes with two hectares of greenhouses on one development. And what this achieves is quite remarkable. It allows to close energy loop, carbon loop, water and mineral cycles. So effectively, the waste heat from the greenhouses in summer is stored in an aquifer to then heat the houses in winter. The waste, the bio-waste, is put in a biodigester and creates biogas, and the waste carbon is used to grow the plants. The water from the houses, the grey water, is recycled and cleaned and run through the plant growing. And of course, the minerals, the urine I mentioned earlier, also go back in the cycle. Or like this project in Helsinki. It's called Low to Know. And we've been working with a very forward-looking developer on this for some time. It made food an integral part of the building design of a whole mixed-use development urban block. And the idea behind this was the realization that if you want to reduce carbon emissions, you also have to include in this. Uh, you can't just deal it at a building level and turn up the insulation if such a large chunk of it, of your personal carbon emissions, are related to food. So what started out as a concept of an integrated rooftop farm with some smaller scale greenhouses for the individual housing units eventually expanded into a broader theme and the developers started thinking about alternative rental modes encouraging smaller scale retailers which usually have often more localized food but also even further on other projects to use the quality of food as an attractor for placemaking. So think the concept of borrow market as a whole driver for a regeneration scheme. This developer has really recognized the value of including food in their thinking, and they have since included it and applied it to other projects. But of course, there's also built projects where food production is really operational and totally integrated with the building. Yes, it's small at scale, but it's up and running for a few years now. It's Whole Foods in Brooklyn. Carbon and waste heat here can be recycled in the greenhouse, and the produce, of course, is sold in the shop below. It's operated by a company called Gotham Greens, 
and they have already four greenhouses in New York and in Chicago, including one on a soap factory. And it's happening in London too. We're working with Grow Up. This is a small, innovative startup company. They got government funding to build a commercial aquaponics farm in London. So that is growing fish and greens in the closed loop systems. So basically, you know, the fish eat, they shit in the water, which is the nutrients for the plant, and the plant cleans the water and puts the oxygen in for the fish. So they're both very happy with that. They just built their first commercial farm of this type in the UK. And we're helping them with the MEP systems and sustainability. The farm is in a warehouse, so there's no natural light, and it uses the latest LED technology. They're testing, of course, the commercial viability in the London market, and we're helping them with looking at the sustainability concept of this. And at the moment, it looks very promising. So with this in mind, you can really think of food production in cities in a very different way. You can consider, of course, roofs of your buildings and just check if there's any significant space left after you put all the plant. But let's remember, it's the building surface closest to the sun. And in therefore, it is ideal for food growing. And I think I've shown plenty of examples where that works. But with the LED system, and if that works on a sustainable level, you can also look anywhere in your building. And I don't know if any one of you remember Andrew Lepinia's talk, Why is the world full of oversized plant rooms? So I'm not sure I need to say any more on that. <laughs> <laughs> but to finish off, if you remember I asked in the beginning, why should you or why should anyone look at food when they think about their next project? Well, I believe there is in London, there is real opportunity. So in the year 2000, they've done a study on the resources going into London. 6.9 million tons of food were consumed. 81% of that was imported. And on average, each ton traveled about 640 <coughs> kilometers. Um, the ecological footprint of Londoners was 49 million global hectares. That is 293 times the size of the city, or twice the size of the UK. And food, as I said earlier, accounted for 41% of that. Now, a friend of mine, Oscar Rodriguez, went about estimating how much suitable roof space there is in London. So he looked at flat roofs and been very empirical about it. And he estimates there is 1,650 hectares of suitable roof space in London. If you multiply that by the productivity of one of the farms I show at 300 tons per hectare per year, you can produce just about under half a million tons per year. If you take today's population of London of 8.6 million people and multiply it by the average UK consumption of fruit and vegetables, which is 130 kilograms per year, you end up at 1.1 million tons. So London's roof spaces could provide just under 44% of the needs of London. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and I think, Farah, we can now take questions. Yes? Thank you very much, that was really interesting. I was just wondering whether you had any examples of this sort of thing in the global south, because it's all very northern uh, hemisphere, because that's quite a different issue, especially in thinking of terms of migration and responsibility in the food system, where we've been getting our food for so long from countries. Yeah, I have, I have deliberately focused on the developed world, because given the audience and that we're in London, I wanted to explore what the put opportunity is here. In the global south, there is many examples. I mean, estimates are that about 450 to 800 million our people are already doing urban farming. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's as you said, it's a very different story. This has to do with land use rights and, and all sorts of things. So I wasn't focusing on that, but you can find examples of this all around the world. It's not unusual, but I thought for our London context, I think this is slightly less relevant, so that's why I focused on the one end. Yes? Does the introduction of um, vegetation in cities have any significant um, impact on carbon 
absorption? Well, big question. Where I would start is, is an interesting story a friend of mine told me, and this is about a greenhouse farmer in the Netherlands. And the interesting thing about it was that this farmer was running his boilers in summer. Now, clearly, that wasn't because he wanted the heat. It was because he wanted the carbon. So I'm thinking, we have building systems, and we're burning still a lot of stuff in buildings to make electricity, hot water, and so forth. So maybe where we should start thinking is capturing that carbon from the building and putting it straight back into the greenhouse. Um, of course, there might be a chance that carbon is captured from the air. I don't have any figures for that, so I wouldn't rule it out. But I would start with the building integration. Yeah? I live in a, uh, an apartment block with a flat roof, uh, which would be perfect for this. But the freeholder's or default position to any request is no. What needs to happen, do you think, to, to allow these projects to take place? Well, good question. I think you need to talk to your freeholder. Well, I'm happy to talk to your freeholder. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, it, I mean, th that, that is obviously something difficult to tackle. And I, I'm aware that there will be also planning issues. You know, you need to categorize this and so forth and so forth. But I think, you know, if people start really thinking at that from the outset and making the case, and more and more people are doing so, there will be more and more <coughs> opportunity. And I'm very hopeful if you, if you look at New York where this is taken off big times, uh, you know, where there's two different farm types growing up and they're expanding all of them um, that you know we can do something in London <coughs> yes does the um, book uh, just picking up David's point about um, getting people's buy-in because I, I can imagine that for a new project setting up a farm on a roof mm -hmm. and there's a lot of enthusiasm um, is excellent um, ten years down the road people have left the apartment block and moved on and maybe maintaining the level of enthusiasm to carry on farming a rooftop um, farm is maybe reduced. Um, is, do, do the economics of it stack up? Is, is, is there always a, a good profit-making enterprise there? You're asking me whether this is a golden calf which would always lay golden eggs? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know whether the economic case always stacks up. You know, that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But. I mean, what I find very encouraging, you know, I've been monitoring this for a long time, and you've seen lots of crazy ideas from the early noughties of kind of totally vertical buildings, and none of that has happened. But over the years, there's been a steady increase in these kind of rooftop greenhouses, and, uh, you know, they wouldn't operate, and they wouldn't expand if it wasn't economically viable. And I think in terms of you said people moving out. I think you've got to be very clear on the outset of your project how you pitch your food growing. If this is a community oriented project and it is about educating people about food growing and seasons and all of that, which is brilliant, that is one thing. If you are looking to attract a commercial operator, it's a different thing. If you have a commercial operator, then that company obviously has an interest in keep on existing. Um, and so people moving in and out of that building becomes less of an issue. It might actually be that people want to live in that building once they realize if there's a farm on top, you know, it might help with the heating bill, it might help with other bills, there might be a little bit of revenue coming to maintain the building. But people want to live there and they might want it as a lifestyle choice. I mean, it's really nice if you can have fresh fruit and vegetables for breakfast which, haven't been picked, which have been picked this morning rather than having traveling the country for two weeks. Uh, I think it was excellent. It was a, it's a great concept. Uh, it, sh it should be adopted. I'm not sure how you drive the change. That's always going to be the, the, the challenging thing, particularly with uh, the business cases. But the more business cases you can put together, then the, the, the more chances is, is for that kind of development or integration with development that uh, urban farming can have. Um, at present, um, we don't have too many projects that would be ideally suited for this kind of work. But uh, I think it's something we would certainly want to, to bring to the party uh, in discussions with developers that we, that we have. It's definitely um, it's one of these things. I think you, you're going to have to have a business in mind, someone you can bring to the table to show the benefits in the business model to the developer. Because if they can see uh, the pounds and pence in integrating it, then it's got every chance of getting up. Yeah, well, I thought it was very inspirational. We're um, doing actually a project with the London School of Architecture now, 
uh, looking at food in Soho. So we're going to hopefully uh, look at incorporating some of ICA's ideas into our project. So in terms of infrastructurally, um, we're going to try and incorporate um, some of the typologies of design into our proposals. We're looking at Soho in a kind of wider sense, and specifically uh, our kind of study group is looking at food. Um, and I think it works very broadly, doesn't it, in terms of the economy, in terms of the political stances government might have, um, and then further through into like policy making. So, um, as a colleague of mine uh, mentioned earlier, um, you know, one of the key questions, isn't it, how, how does it work in terms of policy? And I think that's something that needs to be addressed or kind of understood. Uh, I thought it was very interesting, a very interesting talk. I think uh, there'll need to be a fundamental shift in terms of people's understanding of where food comes from and their relationship to food. Because mm. I think for quite a long time, cities have been, they've been developed through food and food structures. But to, for so long, it's been a non-considerable in terms of how, how that sets up a city. And I think if you look at places like Soho, where it has 35% of Westminster's food stores, just in a square mile. Um, and then if you look at places like Hackneywick, Brownfield sites, um, the opportunities of those areas. I think, yeah, I think it's extremely exciting for the future. I thought it was great, actually. Um, about the right pitch for this time of the morning. But uh, particularly, um, it's always nice to see um, pictorial explanation underpinned with statistics that you actually believe. So um, I think that's something that Arab's pretty good at, generally, is, is kind of explaining these complicated systems um, simply and making wide-ranging groups understand them. So it was, it was nice to see. And uh, there were some things I hadn't heard before, which is always good. Some of the detail about exactly how much food London uses, where it comes from, um, you, know, it was an, you know, there was those kind of big scale thinking pieces about you know, the area required to feed London. And then some of the, you know, in the questions, it was really interesting to hear some of the detail about, oh, um, well, of course, we're importing tomatoes from Spain, and that means we're importing water from a desert. You know, it's something you don't think about every day, but uh, you know, that's really quite a horrendous thing to be doing, and we should all be trying to do more about it, I think. So it was, it was thought provoking. Thank you.